So, welcome again to the current uh, lesson. Um, we still have just three left. So today we want to convert the existing program or program combination of a lot of scripts into a usable, um, let's say, software suite. Um, and therefore, uh, we use what we already have and we want to convert everything into functions and we want to use these functions. Let's start with the tasks. The idea is that we now convert all existing scripts to functions. Uh, we should think about generalizations of the functions um, and we should, we should try to prepare everything so that we can get a method to use a main script where we control our system. So that you get an idea of what we want to get at the end of this lesson is the following. So I just want to start uh, a program which shows what, what is the idea behind. So if you start the program, you start with a menu and then you can select what you want to do. Um, in this case, it's not. It would not be. Uh, it would not be necessary to have the Excel read and the read table. Uh, it just would be necessary to read directly the Excel file or to read a, a text file. I put everything in because we have it. And therefore, what you do is, for example, you push then the one, and then you read the Excel file, and then you enter the file name. So group zero one dot xls. And then you open this file. And then after opening the file, um, costs a little bit of time, especially when video stream is, is running. And then after opening the file, a new menu starts and you see it's an extended menu. So you can of course uh, open another file um, if you want, or you can plot the raw data. So let's plot for example, the raw data. So if you push the 10, then you can select if you want to plot single um, sensors. For example, if I enter one, then you will get the plot of just one single sensor. So, and with this, you can of course uh, change the sensor. So let's do it like this. And I can continue the plotting. Let's plot the sensor two, for example or a sensor three so that you can you can uh, run through this and then of course you can also uh, plot all sensors so for example you enter 10 and then you enter zero and then you will see a plot of all sensors so as we know it and then you can do a calculation of the arithmetic uh, mean for example you enter the corresponding uh, menu item so we can enter the length of the interval, like let's say 50. And then if we start the processing, you see that now we can also plot the aggregation or the aggregation with raw data. So let's have a look, plot the aggregation or still the aggregation of sensor one. And then you see, um, here's an error, you see, I have to clear the window before and then uh, we can we can plot it. So again, let's plot just single sensor and let's plot the first aggregation. So, and then you see just the aggregation, for example, and you can continue 11 of aggregation two and so on. Or you can plot the aggregation with the raw data together. So let's plot the first one. And then you see the raw data and the aggregation. So the background, what is running here is exactly what you already know, what you already have created just in another style. And I will directly explain what is the big difference in this style. And then of course, um, you can also do a comparison. For the comparison, you need more, uh, uh, different methods of uh, aggregation. So let's do uh, aggregation uh, with outlier detection also with 50. And then a new menu 
exists, new menu item exists, where you can compare the different outliers. So let's compare, for example, for sensor one. And then you will see that now you have the comparison here. And for example, if you also calculate um, the Q weighted mean with 50, for example, then you will, you will have a new menu set where you now can also compare, for example, all of them. So like here, let's compare all of them for sensor one. So if I zoom in, you see now you can compare. And with this, you're very flexible. You don't have to take care about the different figures. You're very flexible and you can uh, adapt the things. Um, and of course you can do the contra plot with the last calculation so that you will get also the contra plot. Okay. So um, therefore you have a lot of possibilities. Um, you can also compare, for example, uh, different mean calculations. So let's, let's, for example, calculate the arithmetic mean again with five minutes. And let's calculate the arithmetic mean again with 50 minutes. And then let's compare these two presentations. And then you see, if you, if you look into this diagram, you see the differences where you have the different uh, smoothing levels and things like that. So this is where we want to come to now. So what, what, is, what should be the result? And before we, we can also stop, of course, the processing, for example, with 99, then the, the process stops. So this is what I mean with software suite. You see, I don't change anymore the program. I can read in different sources. Um, the only uh, restriction is that it's always the same motorway because I still use the same chainage or the same naming of the exits. Uh, if you can read also this information from external, then you're really flexible about that. Um, but the idea behind is clear. You can, um, or you create a software program where a user can run the tests without any knowledge about your software and without any changes in the software and with a very flexible, adaptable mechanism. Um, and therefore we have to change a little bit the structure. So before we do this, which structure did we have? So um, we currently have the following structure. Uh, with the scripts. So we started with a reading. So we started, for example, with XLS read. This was a script. And then we programmed the um, read table and we programmed the load mechanism, or we, we call it just read. So, and then we did a plot. So in the first, the raw data plot. So in the first test, we just connected it to here so that we called the script and we did the plotting. In later versions, we added here a menu. So we requested the plot so that we were able to select uh, what, what we wanted to do. So for example, we, we were able to load. So here's a request of a menu and so on. So, and then we did the pure aggregation and it called this different program. So if we call this, we also called this. So it was a really strict static uh, sequence. And then we also, did the aggregation without outliers. And then we did the aggregation with Q mean. We always called the previous one so that we always got also uh, an output of the, of the image. So for example, we got an image here, a figure, and we got a figure here, we got a figure here, we got a figure here. 
Then we wanted to adapt the, um, the interval size, so we created a menu or a input request here and here and here. And then um, we did the comparison. So in, in our case, the comparison called this, this, and this, because the problem was here that all of the aggregations uh, were stored in the same, in the same, um, um, how should I say, um, naming or matrix, and that we always use this clear, all, close, all, and CLC, because this is our main part in the scripts. Clear, all, close, all, and CLC. So because this is the main part of the script that we always delete the previous one. If you didn't want to have this, we have to break this rule and we have to uh, uh, run the scripts also with a clear, all, close, all, and CLC. Uh, but if you do it continuously, also the workspace, Growed with additional um, information. So we did this comparison and that we were able to deal with these different return values uh, or it was not really a return value, it's just a value which was created here. We stored it here in a specific file so that we were able to read it back uh, for the plotting. So you see a lot of such workarounds were necessary. And then uh, we got also this comparison figure. So we had different figures, one, two, three, four, five. And then we did the um, contour plot, this P color plot, which also called again the previous one. And you see, it's a very, very static setup and we created a new figure again. So the disadvantages are, uh, or uh, disadvantages are that you have this very uh, strict static setup that you have always to remember what happened before and what was created before. How are the names of the created elements here? Um, you have to delete things in the workspace which uh, are not necessary anymore. If you don't do it, it grows. Um, and things like that. And of course you have on different positions, um, requests, user interactions, things like that, which you cannot avoid and things like that. So this is our static um, sequential setup. I would say this is the learning prototype. So what we now want is the following. We want one, main program, which is in principle nothing more than a menu or workflow um, processing or control. And it individually selects according to special restrictions. The restrictions are you cannot plot data if you don't read values. You cannot do an aggregation if you don't have the values. If you want to do a comparison, you need different aggregations. If you want to do a color plot, you need the aggregation, at least one. So you have uh, constraints and restrictions, which you have fulfilled in the menu, but at least it does nothing more than a call. Now, not of scripts, now of functions. Let's make the function with this symbol here. So with a function, for example, uh, read or load, and another function, if necessary, um, read table and so on, and another function with plot. And if you compare this, what you did here for the plotting, so we always plot it here. If you compare this, the plotting is very, very similar because you use a matrix, which is in lines, the sensor description. So it means you have each line is one sensor, uh, one day of uh, data, and therefore you get this and you select the individual line and plot it. The only difference is the output of the headlines. So I, I did not change it in my program here. 
but the output of the headlines is it may, might be different. So what else is required? The names of the sensors, but the rest is very similar. So that if you have one generalized plot function, then it's it's helpful uh, for all of the plots throughout the process except the p color plot. And then you can also have another uh, function, for example, which does the aggregation. If you compare the different aggregations, what is the difference? The difference from here to here is that you use a, a special um, intermediate vector where you delete outliers. Compared to here, you can use the same. So if you do this here as well, and you don't delete the outliers, these two functions are exactly the same. If you compare it to Q mean, what is the difference? The difference is that you use another mean function. So if you use another mean function, it's just that you select which mean function you want. And it doesn't matter if you delete the outliers before or not. The only important thing is that you delete uh, also the Q uh, things in, in, in the function. Or you select either if you have this aggregation with a normal arithmetic mean, then you do this outlier uh, check. And if you have the Q mean, you don't do this. So, but these three scripts are exactly the same. So therefore you can have one generalized aggregation function. And then you can have one generalized um, P color function. And finally, what we forgot is this comparison. The comparison is nothing more than an additional function, uh, which is in principle a, a, a plot again, where you plot with this, the different outputs. So therefore, here you just have to take care if you keep the figure. So if you use hold on, hold off, or not, so that you keep the existing figure and you paint again with the same plot in the existing figure. And therefore, what is the comparison? The comparison is we, we don't do a subtraction of the results, we just plotted it. So therefore, comparison is nothing more than um, three times or two times the call of the plot with a different color. So therefore you already know um, what you need here as a handover argument. So you need a color, you need a, a hold on, hold off flag, um, things like that. You need the, the X axis, you need the Y axis. The Y axis is the matrix with the sensors. So therefore with this information, you can start to create your uh, different um, your different uh, functions. And therefore, what you do is, in principle, you take what you created here and you just copy it to here. You don't have to take care on the naming. Um, if you do this, you can directly improve the naming if you want, but you don't have to take care on the naming because everything what is inside the function will keep uh, or will be kept inside of the function. So therefore, this read, for example, if you name it in a special way after you jump out and you return the result, then everything inside is forgotten. There you, you just have to define the interface. So therefore, this area here is called the interface of the function. So these are the arguments which you hand over and the return values which you uh, get back. And the return values must be the return values which you need further on in the uh, following processing. So, and, and therefore you change from a very strict hierarchical structure where you have to know a lot of things to a very flat um, main controlled uh, structure where you have different modules here, um, which you can call or not. And you do the call dependently of a manual which you which you uh, prepare. So the main work will be to create this part here because this is a very new program. The rest is more or less copy and paste where you have to do like with the aggregation where you have to do some com combinations of the existing uh, things. So you do a copy and paste and you do special selections. For example, you hand over also the uh, 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 selector for the type of the aggregation, things like that. So, and this is, we change now from here to here. 
And also what I do here now, this painting is also in principle a change from, uh, let's say script hacker to um, program designer. So usually if you really write programs, large programs, you can of course do some small tests with this style. But if you really want to create a larger program for the thesis or for other things, uh, then you usually sit down and you first of all check what you need. You try to bring it into blocks of logical com combinations, and then um, you just connect them with a main control uh, so that you can use it. So this is software architecture. This is a software architect, and this is let's say a, a hacker a hacker method. So you just sit down and write programs. Um, it works. You saw it. It works, but it has some um, disadvantages. And the big disadvantages are if you use this in one or two years, or maybe in ten years, then it's very, very difficult to to find all of the problems or of the things what you have to know. Here, you don't have to take care because these boxes are almost like black boxes. So what you have here is you, you have a naming which is really always local in these parts here. So um, you don't have to take care and it's like a black box which is called with the arguments and which returns um, information from this. So therefore, this is a very essential part. And for learning is of course this structure, I think uh, the best way because it goes step by step to the next steps. But for a real software, which you can use later on and for further programs, which you maybe will create, this is, the preferred way. So you sit down and first of all plan everything. So long explanation. Let's do the things. So what I do now is um, it depends on how you create this. I do uh, in a full. I do it in the following style. I put everything into one MATLAB file. Um, this works if you just call functions. So you have one function which can be called from external. So one function which can be called from here, from the command window. This function must have the same name like the file here. Um, and then you can call other functions which are part of this um, so that uh, you can have everything in one file. It depends on you. You can, of course, keep the same style as we had it. So that, for example, you use uh, for each function a separate script file, and then you have a library and you can store all of these things in one special directory. You add this directory to your uh, search path in MATLAB, and then you have everything what you need as well. And you have separated modules for individual things and you can uh, call them. Uh, the advantage is that you can use these functions later on as well in other projects. If you do it like this, you have one pack and you just can call the main function and um, the other functions are hidden behind. So therefore, um, you have to decide what you do for, in my case, where I just want to show you the general principle and where you, I want to give you just a very short possibility to download the files from Moodle, for example, I put everything into one file. So which is the starting point? First of all, we start with function definition we have to name it in the same name like or within the same name like with uh, like the file so ts complete complete show checked step by step and if we don't hand over anything then um, it's a function with no arguments and no return values. So this is my main program in principle. And I always put return here so that you always will see which parts belong to which. So before we start with the main here, um, this is for example, also the only position where we do a clear all close all and CLC. Um, you can do, of course, this close all later on also in the in the script. For example, if you change from the um, from the subplot structuring to the plot structure, this was this error which you saw. So I forgot this on one position to close the the, the uh, diagram, and uh, therefore um, 
therefore uh, you have to do it manually um, to, to get the right output. So this is the only position where we are really clear because we call this this function. And the principle is like this, you start this and then it runs, okay? So in our case now, it does not, not so much. So, and then we, we go back to our, uh, to our structure. Um, what do we need? We need the read function. So let's start with the read function. Um, let's start with this XLS read. So we create a function. And if you check your script, which things were used later on? You used the speed, you used the Q matrix, you used the time and you used the sensor names. These are the things which we created step by step in the script. And therefore you, you do it like this. We, I give the same name like what we had is XLS read and what we hand over is the file path. We had a hard coded file path inside. So therefore um, it was fixed to group 01 XLS, but now we can enter uh, individual file paths. So what else do we do? We keep the same structure and the only difference of the first things which you have to change is you use the file pass and you write XLS read. So you combine output, you display what the, what the uh, function does. And uh, then you do the XLS read. So you do num data, text data, raw data, which you get in XLS read. Instead of the hard coded file, you use the file pass. The rest, everything you have inside the rest here is exactly the same what you have in the script. The only difference is that everything what you create inside and what is not part of these return parameters will be destroyed after call of this function. Um, a disadvantage now here is if you do it in this style and if you don't use a separate script uh, situation so that for example um, you have a main script where you call things after ending so for example if I call this function here with this style And if I use here group 01.xls, then after running this program, it will read the XLS, but if you watch the workspace, nothing is there. Why? Because it's a function and after reading this, it's destroyed. Okay, so therefore this is a big disadvantage of this method which I use here that you don't have the things available that you can don't uh, that you are not able to test it if you want to test it you can set a breakpoint here um or maybe here before you jump out and then if you run it it will stop at this breakpoint and you will see the situation as it is um at this breakpoint so this is the disadvantage if you don't use separate files and if you don't have uh, a main script which is not a function okay but in my case there's no big uh, restrictions for that so um, the nice thing is if you have it in one file you can click onto the plus and the minus and the plus and the minus shows you the body of the function okay so if you do this you have now the first read method and we do this for all of the different read methods so in, in our case we have two additional so i just copy and paste the things from the existing parts and i just name it so ts read table ts read table was a script before and now it's a function and uh it returns the same like like here so therefore we create always the same things and the only difference is that we use file path here um and uh, instead of a uh, hard coded and the same is for ts load we call it ts read um i use now ts load so that it's it's um, let's say uh clear because the next two <clears throat> the next two uh, tasks in next and a uh, week after next week uh will create a sophisticated method or functionality to read ascii files okay 
So, and with this, you're now able, for example, if you change it, TS load here. And of course you have to change TXT. And this is where you can also uh, try to check. I did not do it here, uh, but for a sophisticated suite, software suite, you have also to check if it is a text file or if it is not a text file. A simple check would be the extension check. A uh, more complex check would be you read a little bit of the file and then you check if the file follows special structures, okay? But nevertheless, um, if, if you run this then, um, it reads now the file and um, have it available uh, or prepares everything for the for the reading. Um, so let's first of all continue here to get the menu. So if you remember, um, I directly give new names here. And in base cases, you use this camel case style. So I always use this. And you can also add, for example, additional units if you want. You can say this is in kilometers per hour, things like that, so that you have all information directly available. Um, so that you, if you read it in two years or 10 years, you directly know again, what is the, the content of this. So before we start, we create empty matrices so that if you add things to this, it would also work. And then if you remember, um, in best case, you always provide a menu, which does not stop even if enters uh, or entered um, um, numbers from the menu will be wrong or are wrong. So therefore we create a while loop which runs endlessly. And then in this while loop, this is the main while loop, uh, we do our menu request. This is also a while loop where just the menu request will be done. This general while loop is for keeping the processing after different tasks. This while loop is just checking the inputs and uh, things of the menu. So if something is entered, which is not yet in the menu, um, then it will just continue with an output of the same menu again. Okay, you can do it with one while loop as well, but um, I separate it so that it's a little bit more logic. And then what do we do? We display um, the menu. So in our case, we display the following menu, and then we select one, two, and three, which is XLS read, read table, and text file. So, this is just the display. And then we have to do the processing. So we have to do the request of this. This is out just the displaying. So it also directly add this stop processing. And now we have to request information from the user, which selection we do. And now we can directly process if, if we want, but uh, it is always best if you check if uh, entered numbers are really correct. So therefore we do a selection. If it is one, two or three, or if selection is equal to 99, then we interrupt this menu part here. How can we interrupt the loop? With break. So if we enter something wrong, so let's check this. If we enter something wrong, something wrong. Uh, I forgot the dot dot dots. So here is, is essential if you don't complete the condition then these dot dot dots are essential. Um, it's always helpful if you separate into logical pieces. 
So let's run it. Again, an error. Uh, an additional uh, trace. So, but now it should work. So, and if you enter now something wrong, then the menu is kept. And only if you enter something correct, then it will process. So why do we have now again the output of this menu? Because of this external while loop, because after we check everything, this is just the communication to the user, we have to do the real operation which is requested. And this operation can be done with a simple switch case statement. We don't have to check otherwise or default because nothing else can be entered here if we check everything correctly here. Um, and then we have the different requests. So what do we do? We delete things here, even if it is already created because we it can happen that we already read things and we always want to have a version situation. And then we do this call of our read function. The one is the read of the XLS. So therefore we have to do TS um, XLS read. And this is the call of this function here, okay? So, and then um, we can directly set a flag, which tells us if data are available. Because with this data are available, we can um, extend our menu so that the menu grows uh, during the processing. So we remember that data available, available, available equals and to do this, you of course have to set data available here to zero. Because if data are not available, we just have the standard processing. So, and we do exactly the same here, just with a different call, though the second one is the read table. And the third one is again the same with TS load. So, and in 99 here, it's quite simple because with 99, you want to interrupt the processing. So, it means we want to stop the processing, and stopping the processing means we want to interrupt this external loop here. So what do we do? We already know it from here. We use break. So, and this break is the interrupt for us uh, to run uh, or to interrupt the running, okay? So, if you run this then, then we can now interrupt the processing or we can read data, let's read text data, and it directly loads the file. So the first thing is managed. So what do we have? We want to have a very flexible um, reading. So therefore we want to uh, request the file from the user. So now we can do the straightforward thing again what you did in the script. So you request here the file name with the input, but if you do it here, you have to do it here and you have to do it here as well. Uh, main principle for software design or architecture is that you should avoid redundancies. So just 
use copies where you have slight changes or where the influences or the, the, the size is very small. Also reduce functions to a minimum. So therefore, it is much better if you add here an additional um, section, for example, where we do the following. As for one, two, and three, you always have to request the file. Then directly request the file here. And then you use the file pause. So it means that you just have one uh, line or one uh, area in this code where you have to do the, the uh, request and uh, or the, the, the things to ask for file name. And therefore, if you want to add additional things, you don't have to, to do it three times. You just have to add it here or change it here. So reduce it to a minimum. So let's see the behavior. I start it again. And then if you read the file, I now use always the text file because it's faster here for the demonstration. Um, then you can enter file name. Of course, a really sophisticated program would also first of all check if the file name, the entered part here is really correct, is a text, because you can also enter a number here. Um, so that you do additional checks. So this is also part of this if. So if you do these checks, then you just have to do it once here and not three times on, on other positions. So let's read group 01.txt. And then you see everything processes quite well. Okay, so first thing is done. Now we want to plot the data. We want to plot the raw data. <coughs> so therefore, another function is required, which is called the plot function. So let's shrink this. And let's add, sorry, let's add here another function. So usually, if you start with this, you think about what does the function need for the processing? So what are the handover arguments? If you remember the plotting, so therefore this, this let's say, prototyping is quite nice. So, and there is the big advantage of MATLAB because it directly can test plotting with a script and then you can convert it to a real program and you directly see the outputs. You, you don't need the complete setup of programs around. It's just necessary that you, you see the local, uh, the local uh, behavior and you can interrupt the things. So therefore we write a function and you have to think about what do we need for the plot. Let's call it tsplot. And tsplot is now uh, used, so a generalized mechanism to plot the raw data, the aggregation, um, all of these things. And to plot also two different scenarios or scenarios into the same plot. So this means that if we uh, want to plot the raw data with the aggregation, then we use the same plot function. We just switch on or off the hold on and hold off situation. So what do we need? Of course, we need the plot matrix. This plot matrix must fulfill special conditions. So each line is a sensor. By the way, commands which you add here can be used for the help. If you write help TS load, for example, if you have it in a separate file, of course, if you write uh, help, then you will get this printed thing until you have one empty line. So um, therefore you can add additional information, user information, usage information, um, information about the handover arguments, about the return ar arguments, things like that, so that you get automatically a help about the function. So we need the plot matrix, we need the X, which is the time steps. Let's just call it time steps minimum, uh, uh, or minutes, sorry. Um, I use different names here because you should see that 
it doesn't matter how you name it here, as long as you use the same name in the function. So outside, you can assign it with different uh, names, with different possibilities. It's just important that inside of the function, the name is consistent. So I give different names with different styles. Uh, if you really do a sophisticated and, and clear programming, then you will always follow a special style guide. So there's a special MATLAB style guide, which you find in the internet, for example, uh, so that the, the style is always the same. Also, the names are always the same. So what else do you need? You need the sensor names, of course. And now we can select the individual sensor. Um, now you have different possibilities. You can uh, use the method which is used by MATLAB so that you have a pair. You say, for example, um, sensor line and then, or sensor name, and then you write the name so that you always have a key and a value. Um, because MATLAB supports also um, optional arguments, so a list of optional arguments, and therefore you can you can use this. This is one possibility. Another thing is that you use sensor names uh, or the sensor name, and you convert the sensor name to the line uh, using the sensor the sensor names uh, uh, vector. I do it in a very simple way here. I just use the sensor line. And if you enter here a number, then uh, you will get an individual sensor. If you enter a zero, then you will get all sensors. Then uh, what else do we need? The color. If you want to plot into the same into the same plot, then we have to select an individual color. And what else? If you want to plot in the same plot, then we need also a marker identifier. If for example, uh, we should use the hold on or hold off button. So I call it refresh. So these are my handover arguments. And his plot does not return anything. Uh, usually in really software packages, there are no functions doing nothing as a return. All functions will return something and uh, at least they return error codes. So if something worked, uh, uh, it did not work, then an error code is, is uh, returned. So therefore, remember the minus one from the sensor data, this minus one is in principle an error code. And this is also, this error code can also be used here. Or uh, another error code can be used here. So in, in our case, again, short information. If you use the help function and then, we create a figure and then we do exactly the same what we did in, in the normal plot. If you remember, we calculated the max uh, uh, speed to get the limits, the y and the x limits. We do the same here. And then we can split into two pieces, into the subplot section and into the single plot section. How can we select if sensor line is greater than zero? Then we have a single plot because we select an individual sensor. If it is not like this, then we do a plot of all outputs. And if you watch the plot of all outputs, is already what we have. So what do we do? We run through all of the elements and we plot the data. And this is exactly what you have here for the plotting which we did. So if you want information about if it is an aggregation or if it is uh, another uh, method uh, of, of calculated data or something like that, then you can also use here, uh, handover information, so that you say, for example, an additional tag and things like that, um, which you can use here. I just use sensor and I don't change uh, the, the names here. The only difference, what we did not use here, and you see it because it's here uh, highlighted with a, a yellow background, we do not use the refresh at the moment. So where do we have to use the refresh? The refresh means if we have a one, 
then we want to uh, write a new figure. If we have a zero, then we want to overwrite the existing one with additional information. So that, or we, we want to plot it in, in the same plot. Again, if we have a one, then we overwrite. If we have a zero, then we plot into the same plot. And therefore we have to use it here in front of the plot where really the plot is done. And we just do the following. We request if refresh is zero, then we do hold on. If refresh is zero, we do and hold off later on again. This is quite important. Um, this situation should not leave the function. So do not switch on in one function and switch off in another function. Keep always everything as local as possible. If you switch something on, which influences the whole behavior, then also switch it off again um, uh, in the same function. So um, what is the difference? The difference is quite simple. Um, the difference is just that you don't have to use the, um, the subplot. So therefore you can reduce it again to a minimum, but let's, let's completely uh, program it. So you do nothing else like this here. just avoid the subplot and the for loop and instead of the subplot and the for loop you do the following because now you can enter any number you want and you should always give a warning and you do nothing else else you can do the processing, okay? Um, yeah, that's it. So what you, what you can do is now, if you compare these two things, the only differences are that you have this warning here and that you don't do the for loop and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, um, subplot selection. So therefore, uh, what you can do is you can, shrink this again and you can avoid uh, this these um, redundant uh, outputs here um, so that you reduce the function again. In my case, I keep it as it is, um, just that you think about also to to always avoid uh, repeating uh, repeating commands. So with this, we should have now a function to plot the data. Let's go back to our um, menu. Now we want to add the menu to plot the data. So what do we do? If we have data available, only if we have data available, so if it is greater than, oops, greater than zero, then we display an additional um, output. So this is additional output and this additional output uh, tells us that we now can plot the data display. And then we give the 10 equal plot raw data. So that's it. And with this, we can now have an additional uh, menu item to plot the data. And we have, of course, check if this is also correctly entered. So what do we do? We add here an additional check. An additional check is this. We tell that data must be greater than zero. And that we have the selection 10. So this is just for checking if the user entered something wrong. And later on, then we process. So what do we do?
we go to a new case here and in case 10 we want to plot the data so what do we do in this case now um, we can request the sensor line you can do the same again because later on we want to plot the aggregation so therefore you can say uh, you can also extract this and go to if you have 10 11 and 12 which are the plotting functions for example plot sensor uh, raw data plot aggregation plot aggregation with raw data um, they need this input again so but I, I just want to show you the straightforward thing here and you should still try to improve the things and then we do the ts plot so what do we hand over we hand over the speed matrix we hand over the time steps we hand over the sensor names and over this sensor line and what do we want We want to plot a new part here and we want to plot it in blue. So if you go back, so we want to refresh, we want to set the special color and we want to select the sensor. So this is the call which we do. So and now we can directly test it. So stop the previous run. And now test it. Okay, 965. Um, I always mix it with Python, so I'm sorry about that. But it's live, so therefore no problem. So we enter a file pass. And then if you see now, we have now an additional uh, menu item like here, the 10. Uh, where we can now select the plot. And now we can plot an individual sensor. This is the question which we do here. So let's select sensor one. And again, an error, of course. So let's go to line 226. What is there? Plot count. So of course, plot count is not here because I copied it from here. So plot count is not available. Uh, in my case, I have to use the sensor line here instead. Plot count is not defined. So let's run it again. Let's read the data. And then let's plot the data. And voila, you have the data here. Okay. So, first steps are done. You're now quite flexible. You can plot now different outputs. You see, it changes. And if I enter something completely wrong, I will get a warning. It will, of course, hi highlight the, the figure because we always select figure one. So therefore it comes into the foreground, but uh, it will not do the plotting. So therefore um, it gives me an information that uh, sensor is not part of the data. Let's continue. So we have now the different reads. We have now the different plots. Um, let's continue with the aggregation. So the aggregation is the only function which is really completely different um, in some cases because we merge the different aggregation calculations together. So therefore, again, the same thing where we did before. So we create a new function so we can
So we currently have these functions here, and now we create a new function for the aggregation. So in here, you have to think about what does the aggregation need? So we do function and then T is aggregation. And then we have to think about what do we need? So we need, of course, the speed. In this case, I call it again, speed with kilometers per hour. Then as we want to combine all aggregation, we of course need also the Q weights. So, or the main lane uh, track density. We need the interval length for the aggregation because we have these individual interval lengths. And then we need some controlling mechanisms where we can select the different aggregation types. So we have two different aggregation types, mean and Q-mean. So therefore we can use some things like, like a selection, so aggregation selection. And if we have uh, an additional uh, possibility to detect outliers, we have to select if you want to detect the outliers or delete the outliers or not. So therefore these are my handover arguments. You can extend them during the processing, of course, if you think, oh, uh, if you find out that uh, you need something more, but then you can do this. Okay, aggregation calculates the aggregation and therefore it calculates something, it's not just plotting. So therefore we need return values. The return value of course is the calculated aggregation. This is this matrix, which has the same size like speed with this step function. And to simplify life later on, we also directly hand over or give back or return just the means. Because do you remember in the contour plot, in the contour plot, we use just the mean and not the step function. And therefore, if you directly process it here, you don't have to do selections anymore. You just have it available. So everything what you need, you directly prepare and you get available, okay? So therefore, we hand back or return back this. Now, for example, you have this function again, where you have input arguments and output or return values. So let's make a short description and just to copy and paste from existing program short description that it calculates aggregation, can uh, calculate the uh, arithmetic mean, so aggregation should be one, or Q mean aggregation selection would be two. And we can do outliers uh, detection or deletion when we have a greater zero uh, element. So, and now we in principle copy and paste all of the things which we, which we have um, in the three different aggregation calculations. So what do we do? The first thing is this. We copy the speed into an aggregation matrix and we take the number of time slots. Then we calculate the aggregation. So what do we do? We run through all of the detectors and we run through all of the elements. It's exactly the same what you what you have in the in the uh, existing functions. And then there's only a, a small difference. So you have an individual selection, so therefore select the individual parts. This is a copy and a, a paste thing again. So we select now uh, the participating vector and the participating Q vector. We have just the participating vector available in the aggregation for the outlier deletion. So as we now prepare everything for the whole things, we have to prepare everything now uh, in the style that it can also be used for the Q weighted mean calculation. So therefore, we directly also select the participating Q vector from here. So if you compare this to the aggregation uh, 
maybe print it and, and really put it side by side, then you will see it's exactly the same. The only two big differences are now here because if we select outlier deletion greater than zero, then we do the outlier dele deletion. If it is greater than zero and if it is the calculation with a normal arithmetic mean, then we delete the outliers. Otherwise, we keep the individual participating vector. And then the other difference to the original programs is that we mix together. In the originals, we have now the mean calculation and we directly assign it to the corresponding sec uh, segment in our aggregation matrix. Here we now make a switch according to the aggregation selection. Is If it is one, we do the normal arithmetic mean. If it is two, we do the Q mean. So therefore, if aggregation selection is one, we do the normal mean. If it is two, we do the cumin. And if it is something different, we write an error and do nothing. And we assign it to a local memory variable, which is called mean value. So that in a next step, we do the assignment. So we really break it into these three steps. Take the participating vector calculate the or delete the outliers with the calculation, the individual calculation, and then we assign it back to the individual parts where we need it. And then we do the thing which is which you find in uh, the control plot where we extract the individual means in this way we have now the step function so 10 times 15 times 50 times uh, corresponding to the interval the same uh, set of um, data or mean data and for the um, cal for for the contour plot we need this separated mean data and therefore we extract it here automatically and assign it to the second return value so that's it what you can do is you can add a little bit of output text, uh, which corresponds to the different to the different inputs. So if aggregation selection is one, mean uh, the normal means means or means the normal mean, then we do a calculation uh, of the aggregation with arithmetic mean. If outlier detection is on, then and delete sensor outliers. Otherwise, it does not print this. And uh, else, if it is two, then calculate aggregation with Q weighted mean. If you directly do an else here, you can directly write the error, for example, else, and you write a warning. That this aggregation is not supported. And you can directly do a return. Okay, so therefore you directly check here the uh, situation if there are problems. Okay, so now we have to do this aggregation. Let's go back again to the selection here and let's add menus for the aggregation calculation. So if data are available, we can do the aggregation calculation. And then we have to check here if the entered number is correct. So therefore we add an additional line like this line, we say if data are available and we have the section 20 or 21 or 22, then we break this run. And then we add an additional case here, 20. These are our aggregation calculations. Before I write in here uh, the different things, what 
what uh, calls the or which calls the the different uh, aggregations. Remember what we have here. We always need here a file name. Here we always need the interval length. So therefore, I don't want to copy and paste again all the time the uh, the uh, request of the interval length. Therefore, the same what you find in your aggregation calculation to request the interval length with input, I put now in front of the processing. So if selection is 20, 21 or 22, so mean calculation, mean calculation without layer detection or Q mean, I have to request the interval length and I have to request a real usable interval length. So therefore I do, this is exactly the copy of the things which you have in the TS plot, for example or in the TS aggregation, I'm sorry. So, and now let's fill it with life. This is the calculation of the mean. This is the calculation of the mean without outliers. And this is the calculation of the Q mean. And the rest is quite simple again, because you use the same function, you get back kilometers per hour and kilometers per hour mean, and you call the aggregation with the speed matrix from here, with the Q matrix from here, with the aggregation interval which you requested from here, and then you select the individual function which you want, so in, in this case, mean, it's one, in Q mean, it's two. And you select if you want to do it with outliers or with outlier, uh, or with outlier detection. So without or with. So if you have a zero, the outliers will be kept. If you have a one, the outliers will be deleted. So therefore, let's copy and paste. It's the same with outlier deletion. And it's the same with an two here. So and it doesn't matter if you have a, a one or a zero here because it does not take care of that. So for later comparison, you can directly keep what you create in different names. So um, I use this for a simpler plotting because otherwise you would have to select always the individual plot which you want. Uh, I always keep this for the plotting and I remember the different uh, calculations for just for the comparison effect. So therefore I keep this and in the same style like here data available I also create a flag which tells me aggregation available because I just can do a contour plot if I did aggregation. So therefore I can extend the menu again um, with this information if I have the aggregation available. And therefore I have to also extend these things here. So therefore we create empty matrices so that nothing can happen if we did not do any uh, uh, the things here. So that we have empty, empty outputs. The mean values which we get back is also created here and as empty matrix. And then we also add this additional flag, which tells us if an aggregation is already available. So let's run it. We read the data, I read the data. And then let's do the calculation of the aggregation. You see now a new uh, menu is extended. This is what we created and let's calculate the aggregation. It asks for the um, interval size and let's run it. So now we have the aggregation calculated. It's in the, in the background. We don't see it here in the workspace because this is this disadvantage which I explained that we use a function. But nevertheless, the data are available. So let's 
use the data so that we can plot it. What do we have to do? We have to add an additional menu part. This menu part just appears if the aggregation is available. I put it to the plot functions. So now I'm able to plot the aggregation and also able to plot the aggregation and raw data. Again, same style, we have to extend this. It's now 11 and 12. So I extend the menu. For 11 and 12, we need data available and aggregation available. And then we can have 11 and 12. So therefore, if we enter something different, then it will stop the process or it will continue with the output of the menu again. And then we have to do the processing. So let's scroll down to this. Now let's say case 11 and case 12. So what's case 11 and what is case 12? Case 11 is the plot of the pure aggregation without the raw data. And 12 is the plot of the aggregation and the raw data. So the pure aggregation is quite simple. Because in principle, you can just copy and paste this with the only difference that now instead of the speed matrix here, you now use the aggregation matrix, which we created here. So this is why I use uh, always the same output here. So in, 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 in each individual call, and I just assign it to an individual separate matrix so that the plot here is simpler. Otherwise, I would have to select um, which plot I really want. So, and if I do this, I directly change this to red. The one is kept because I want to overwrite the plot. I want to reset uh, the plot, uh, rewrite the plot with a new output. So, how do we proceed here? Again, we have to set the sensor. Um, and now it's up to you. You see, we have now three times the same question here. So therefore you can also extend it again or uh, extract it again to such a question like here. So that you say if 10, 11 or 12, then do this request. Um, it's up to you. I just want to show you the different possibilities. And then what do we do? First of all, we want to plot the raw data. So this we already know. And then we want to plot the sensors with the aggregation. What do we have to change? We just have to change the zero here because with this we switch on hold on or hold off. So if we do a refresh, we don't use this hold on, hold off. If we don't do a refresh, we keep this hold on, hold off. And therefore, with these two calls, we directly plot a correct output. So let's test it. Let's calculate the aggregation with an interval of let's say 50. And then you see now in addition to this plot we have now these additional possibilities, plot aggregation or plot aggregation and raw data. Let's directly plot aggregation and raw data and let's select the sensor. So let's say sensor one. And what happens? You now have the raw data with the sensor. So it's quite nice. We're, we are quite fast. Um, and we have a lot of functionality already now. And I would upload this um, already created functionality. And the next tasks, um, uh, and I would extend the next task um, so that you extend 
the comparison and also the control plot. The control plot should not be any problem because um, you just have to copy and paste the existing control plot because there are no changes. The only change is that you have to copy it into a, a function. Um, the, the comparison is a little bit different, so you have to write a comparison. This comparison is nothing more than um, a plot of the different, um, yeah, let's say, aggregation mechanisms. So a hint, we save these different aggregations, so you can check if or which aggregation is available. So for example, if you do a 21, you will get also this data available. And if you do a 22, you will also get this data available. So that we have now three matrices with the different aggregation values called aggregation mean, aggregation mean without outliers and aggregation Q mean. And with this, you can do the comparison because the comparison in our case is just plotting. And you already know the plotting from here. So if you compare the mean with a mean with outliers, then you do two plots. If you compare the mean with Q mean, then you do two plots with the individual, uh, individual selections and so on. Therefore, you don't need an additional function. You just add this. And the only additional thing what you have to add with a functionality is the uh, control plot, which is a copy and paste part. So I forgot this uh, detection if only outliers are available so that um, I have to uh, I have uh, forgot to copy and paste these things. So I will add this. And um, the idea is now to upload uh, this and you should extend the last two things. And you should also uh, do a internet uh, research um, and try to write a function which reads ASCII text files. This is just, um, let's say, try a little bit and play if you if you are able to find uh, a method uh, without a teaching at the moment because uh, we have not done this you find uh, the functions in the theory uh, where I just mentioned it so these f functions f open f close f read f seek f blah 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 um, and you should test a little bit what what you can do with the or you should keep in mind that um, it should directly fit into this structure. So a new function which is able to read text file should also return, oh, where am I here, should also fit into this structure. So call it maybe TS read or TS read text or whatever. <clears throat> Hand over the file pass as argument and return speed, Q matrix, time, and sensor names. Um, for a first step, you don't have to select all of these things from the from the read. Just try to read a file and print all of the lines, or select a few lines uh, where the data are available. So these are the three tasks in principle. The first task is uh, extend this. Um, uh, let's say software suite with the comparison, which is just the plotting of the different aggregations. Uh, you need an extension of the menu, you need an extension of the menu input check, you need an extension of this uh, switch case. Then extend the program with a new function um, for the contour plot. And then start with a little bit of uh, research about um, how to read data so that we can replace this TS load with a more sophisticated method, um, really work with uh, uh, text files, okay? So therefore, um, thank you for listening. We'll see each other next week. I will uh, extend the uh, tasks so that you know what you have to do. And I will also extend um, or I will upload this file. So, thank you very much and bye-bye.